Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Ron Patkus, and I'm the head of the Special Collections Library at Vassar. I also teach in the History Department. Um, I want to welcome you here to our event, to our webinar tonight, which is called Work Prints. It's, uh, as you know, relating to the panoramic photographs that Eric Lindblom has taken of the Hudson Valley. Um, tonight's program um, is meant to kick off um, a couple of things that we're doing in the Vassar Library relating to Eric's work. Um, there's an online exhibition, which if you haven't seen yet, you might want to take a look at. It's available through the Vassar Library. And maybe uh, we can post that uh, in the chat uh, as well, in case you want to look at it more quickly that way. We couldn't do a physical exhibition this, this semester in the library because of COVID. Um, but working with the digital team, and especially um, Nicole Scalessa, uh, one of the co-hosts, um, we were able to do, a, a, she did a wonderful online version. And I really encourage you to, to take a look at that. I think you'll like it. Um, you may have noticed when you registered for tonight's program that we also are producing a print publication, um, a hard copy publication. And I, in the, when you registered, you had the chance to uh, note if you wanted a copy mailed to you. Um, if you did note that, we'll have your name and information and we'll send you a copy. If uh, you didn't see that and you're not sure, uh, feel free to, to drop me an email and we'll be happy to send you a copy of that. Um, we're doing that in uh, conjunction with the Catran Press in Cambridge and uh, they do wonderful work. And um, I think you'll enjoy seeing that if you have an appreciation uh, for Eric's work. Um, the proximate reason for, for doing this program is that just, um, just a few months ago, the Vassar Library uh, acquired a collection of Eric Lindblom's Hudson Valley Photographic Archive. Um, we want to uh, give a, a word of thanks to, to James Lindblom and to Sasha Bush for helping us with that acquisition. But um, we're really happy to have that as it um, relates to an, a previous collection that, that Eric had given us. And um, it expresses our interest in, in local history and local book arts as well. So since uh, that was an important acquisition, we wanted to um, have this exhibition and this program um, as a way to, to celebrate that. And as we know, there's so many people in the in the community who knew Eric and loved his work um, that we wanted to connect with you through this program. We have a very full program tonight. Um, you can see there's a lot of people on your screen, um, but they all have some really interesting thoughts and contributions to make to our program. So I'm going to be very brief. What I would like to do, though, is just um, outline for you what our schedule is for tonight. We're going to go for a little more than an hour and I'll walk you through what the schedule is and I think I'll while I'm doing that I'll give a brief introduction to each of the participants so you have that information with you and then uh, we can get started. Uh, the first uh, the, the person who I'll turn to turn things over to uh, when I'm finished it will be James, James Lindblom. James Lindblom, as you know, is, is the son of Eric and Nancy Willard. Um, and uh, James will be giving us some personal uh, reflections on Eric's uh, life and work. Um, we'll then turn it over to Monica Church. Um, Monica is uh, an artist and curator who's lived in the Hudson Valley for many years. Um, she has several connections to Vassar, including being the advisor of the Focus Photography Group. Um, more recently, um, Monica was the curator 
of an, a retrospective exhibition on Eric's work that took place in 2019. And so Monica will be saying a few words, uh, giving us a broad survey of Eric's work beyond his Hudson Valley um, images. After Monica, we'll then have um, Bill Kelly and Michelle Burgess joining us from San Diego. Um, they both um, work at the Brighton Press, which is a fine press in California. Bill is the founder of the press. Michelle is the director. Both are artists. And um, over the years, uh, they've created many fine press limited edition artist books. Vassar Library is, is uh, thrilled to have many of these um, in our collection. And a number of them, not all of them, but an, a number of them uh, represent collaborations between them and uh, Eric and Nancy. Um, one of the, the most famous being a book called The River That Runs Two Ways, which deals with uh, the, the Hudson Valley as you can, the Hudson River, as you can tell from that title. And they're gonna uh, say a few words to us about that. Um, following that, um, Andy Bush, who as many of you know, is professor of Hispanic studies at Vassar, also teaches in Jewish studies. He's gonna read a poem from the book for us, a poem of, of Nancy's. Um, Andy also has um, special interest in Eric and, and Nancy's work. He wrote a, a critical article which appeared uh, a few years ago for the Michigan Quarterly Review. And then uh, Andy will turn it over to Sasha, Sasha Lewis Bush. Sasha is an artist and educator who lives in New York. Um, he grew up working very closely with Eric, learned a lot from Eric uh, when he was young, um, and I think considers him a mentor. Uh, Sasha was the guest curator of the, the online exhibition, and uh, he wrote a wonderful essay which appears both online and in the publication, which I really encourage you to take some time to um, to read uh, when you have a chance, it's, it's, it's well worth it. Um, and then, and once Sasha finishes, the last bit will be, we're, we've saved some time for questions from you, from the audience. Um, I'm sure there, you'll have many comments or, or things you wanna ask about. Um, my colleague in the library, Laura Street, um, who's the digital archivist at Vassar, um, will read your questions. Um, the best way to do that would probably be to put your questions in the Q&A, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. So um, if you have a question, you can just click on that and type it in when we get to that point. And uh, Laura will read out the questions. Um, you can ask a question of any of the participants um, and, th and then they can respond. One last thing, again, I just wanna give a special shout out to Nicole um, for all of her help, especially on the technical side with getting this running. You know, we've all been uh, working with Zoom for a little over a year, but nevertheless, there are always challenges and we really appreciate all the help um, she's given us in so many ways. So I think that's it for my introduction and we're almost on time um, in terms of the schedule. Um, and I, I'm going to turn it therefore over to James. Could you start us off, James? I will. Thanks, Ron. Uh, really appreciate you setting all of this up and organizing uh, this show. It's the first exhi ex uh, exhibition of my father's work since his passing. And uh, it's just really encouraging to see this continued interest, you know, when his own initiative to get things out into the world is, is no longer there. Yes. So I'm just going to offer uh, a few observations based on some questions from and conversations with uh, Sasha that we've had recently. Uh, thinking about the subject of this exhibition, of all the, the landscapes in the Hudson Valley, it, it brought up the, the question about what my father's relationship to nature was. And it got me thinking a bit. And I realized that my father's interest 
in nature essentially ended when the sun went down, that it was, it was the light that he was there for. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't out there in a, in a kind of a, uh, in a, in, in a spiritual sense necessarily. I don't think he would have put that, those terms on it or, you know, an animism. Uh, he was there really for the, for the aesthetics of it. Um, camping really wasn't his thing. You know, when, when the sun went down, there was no more photographs to take. He wouldn't be pitching a tent throwing down a sleeping bag and making a campfire so that he could wake up the next morning refreshed in you know, the mountain air. You know, he loved, he loved the day trip. You know, he would be happy to drive to a mountain range or a forest or, you know, the ocean side, but then he would come home at the, at the end of the day. So for him, I think it's fair to say that his, his relationship with the natural world was with you know through through the perspective of the camera explicitly um and then it seemed kind of interesting to com compare that with my mother who had a, you know a, a different way of viewing the world and just how the two of them managed to mesh their differing approaches uh so well I'm thinking of, of how they would collaborate on occasions and just even when they weren't explicitly collaborating on a project, just how as two artistic partners in a marriage with differing ways of viewing the world, how one could influence the other. Uh, you know, my mom, as someone who had so much invested in the world of magic and fairy tales and such, you know, she would be the one who, if they were walking through the forest and my mom, maybe was observing the, the, the pattern of bark at the base of a tree, she would be the one to say, ah, look, there's the door for the gnome that lives in the tree. And that's, that's something my, my dad would never have, you know, come up with on his own. But it's the sort of thing that once my mom pointed it out, he might have then looked at what she was looking at and thought, you know, that would make an interesting photo and take out his camera and, you know, and, 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 and take a photo that way. Um, you know, maybe, maybe when they were in Cape Cod together, I could see the two of them walking in, in the marshes and my mom looking at some of the salt grass and going, wow, it looks like, you know, the ocean had just brushed its hair. And then my father saying, huh, you know, and then not, not that that ever happened. I'm completely hypothesizing here, but I can easily see how their worldviews complemented each other and even though they didn't spring from the same impulse that they would feed each other's artistic impulses uh in that way um which i think is probably one of the reasons why they they were so successful together uh you know when we were going through the house last year and going through all of the, the many many photos that were in the house just snapshots not necessarily uh, my dad's work there was one photo that I found from Cape Cod, and I can't remember who took it, but it's a perfect shot of the two of them on the seaside. I think probably Wellfleet or Turo. My dad is positioned with his camera, taking a photo of the waves, and slightly off at a distance, my mom's bent over picking up some seashells, you know, for something that she's going to bring home and use in one of her projects, and that. That to me encapsulates the two of them, right? They're out together, each doing their own thing, you know, not necessarily announcing to each other what they're doing, but just being able to coexist in their own pursuits together like that is, uh, you know, exactly how, how I think of them. Um, and then yeah. the last thing I was thinking about with uh, my dad and his, his photography, that even though all of these photos are nature photos, he didn't necessarily describe himself as a landscape photographer or a nature photographer. It was all these different ideas and projects that would grasp his interests, such as, you know, the series in Florence, or towards the end of his life, he had uh, a series of shop windows. And certainly, over the years, there was many, many photos that he did of, of my mother as well. Um, and I know just before he had passed, he had assembled a book of photos of Nancy Willard 
you know, from the five decades or so that he, he'd assembled and put together, I mean, that was a real, a real treat to look at. And there was one particular photo of my mom that I'd found going through everything that was a, you know, formal black and white portrait. And in looking at it, I instantly knew that it was not taken by my father. There was just something about her face. You could tell that she was not looking into the camera or at the face of, of her husband, but instead an anonymous portrait photographer who had been hired to take a photo of her for you know a particular story. And uh, in, in, in that highlighted all the other photos that my father had taken of my mother to that much more of a, of a special degree that there really is something that he could bring out in her, uh, you know, when he when he was making her the subject, and uh, you know, just having the two of them, uh, you know, just growing up in a household like that with two two artists, it it was such a huge influence on me of just pushing me in the direction of being passionate about books or arts in, in, in general. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm eternally thankful to both of them for, for such a gift that they gave me in that way. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad to see again that this is happening. Uh, on that note, I want to turn this over to Monica to, to carry on. Thank you. That was Thank lovely, you. James. I need to share my screen. All right. Thank you to James, Sasha, and Ron for inviting me to participate this evening. I was introduced to Eric Lindblom's work in the 1990s from seeing a poster of one of his photographs, Ben Mar Vineyard at Catskill Art and Office Supply. The beauty and lyricism of the image stayed with me and I became a quiet fan of his work following his exhibitions and book projects. In the 2010s, Eric and Nancy graciously were speakers for Vassar's Photography Club Focus not once, but twice, because the students requested that they return. In April 2018, Terry Quinn and I invited Eric to exhibit in the Palmer Gallery. We decided that a retrospective format would work well, given that the lead time for the exhibition was tight, three months to prepare. The show would open in July 2018. Thus began an intense period of Eric and I looking and talking about his photographs. I will be sharing with you a brief history of Eric's bodies of work, the way he categorized them and thought about them. It's not exclusive, but comprehensive. I will not be speaking, whoop, hold on, there we go. I will not be speaking about he and Nancy's artist books, The River That Runs Two Ways or Waves as Ms. Michelle Burgess, artist and director of Brighton Press will address those projects. Early in Eric's career, he made single photographs that stood alone. False hellebore is rectangular in format and uses an evocative blur to focus our attention on false hellebore plants in the foreground, a plant that's poisonous to sheep. These early sublime photos show the influence of working with landscape photographer Paul Campanigro, who Eric studied with from 1969 to 71. Caponegro's panoramic photos of running white deer, County Wicklow, Ireland, 1967, may have provided the impetus for Eric to pick up a panorama camera in the late 1980s and explore the format for his Hudson Valley photographs that Sasha will talk more about. I will provide a teaser to, his, to this work, a rare vertical format, Black Willow, Weathersfield. As his practice matured, Eric worked in series, usually moved by his curiosity about a subject matter in concert with an interest in learning about how a particular camera might affect his image capturing. In the late 1970s, Eric did what many photographers do, especially when they are finding their voice, carried a camera with him as he went about his life. The resulting series are specific objects found in public places. This series seems to be the beginning of his work using a Diana camera, which I just showed, an inexpensive, complete plastic body toy camera, including a plastic lens. Diana's produced square negatives and Eric's compositions rely on a triad of objects within the square, such as the swing, its shadow, and tree. Angels at the Arno were made between 1979 and 1987. Eric used three Diana cameras gifted to him by friend and fellow photographer, Dan McCormick. In 1979, Eric had received a grant 
to photograph in Northern Europe. However, decided not to stay in Holland, but to relocate with Nancy and James to Florence. He became entranced with the city, traveling there to photograph three more times. Bicycle near the Uffizi Museum shows the Diana square format and center weighted focus. Eric framed the subject just off center, slightly cropping its wheels. He was aware of the light and how each of his cameras leaked light. The next three bodies of work, whoops, sorry about that. The next three bodies of work were all made during his summer on the bay side of Cape Cod, where he and his family spent time each summer. He photographed at Sandy Neck and Barnstable and Cornhill and North Truro, among other places. This is a working list that Eric made and we used when choosing works for his retrospective. His final photos were all numbered. The F stands for, it was framed in K's for keepers. And we kept revising this list until we had just the right amount of work for the show. Um, we started out with over 50 works and I'm not sure what we got it down to, but we ended up filling the gallery full, but not too full. Um, although there were some really beautiful works that did not make it into the show. Eric said that it was the deep shadows that first prompted him to use his four by five Deer Dork viewfinder camera. His salt marsh grass series was most intense from 1998 to 2000. However, he continued to go out each summer that he was able to make more photos of the grass resulting in at least 80 images in the series. This print is number 80 and you can see by how he signed the back that reaching number 80 was somewhat of a surprise and cause for celebration. He emailed me this photo from summer 2018. I believe it was made by James or possibly one of his longtime photography friends. I apologize to the photographer that I don't know who it is. He describes himself in an email saying that he was an old duck waddling with pleasure through the marsh. The Pitch Pine series is really a tribute to what a good photographer Eric was, as most of us looking at this subject matter would see uninteresting scrub pines. Eric saw how the light and depth of field played against the scale of thin grasses and small trunks with figurative branches of this native Cape Cod pine tree. He also turned his lens on the ocean, wading with his four by five view camera into water to photograph in his series waves. This is really the opposite of pitch pines in terms of subject. Where the ocean meets the sand is so overly photographed that these clean, crisp, fresh black and white squares show us a way to see it anew. Eric's window shopping series resulted from his day trips to the nearby towns of Chatham, Red Hook, Kingston, Hudson, and New Paltz, as well as Orleans and Provincetown, Massachusetts, among others. Using a new improved Diana, he called it, Lindblom's careful observation edits out what the viewer does not need to see, composing photographs that are making sense out of the chaos of storefront windows. These images contain reflections of the street behind him and interior objects that he photographed through the plate glass. After reviewing his negatives, if he didn't get a shot the first time, he would return and place his camera at a different angle that worked better for shooting through the windows to achieve what he was after. These storefronts were puzzles for him to sort out for himself and for the benefit of the viewer. My favorite what not shop includes his own reflection an indulgence that is not often seen in his work. The last longest and most personal of Eric's serial subjects centers on his wife, the writer Nancy Willard with whom he eloped in 1964. This photo is Eric doing a final walk through the Palmer gallery before the work went up on the walls. It was bittersweet to only include three portraits of Nancy. He captures her as a young woman, documenting her through to her mature years. This photo accompanied her, Nancy's obituary. There is beauty and intelligence infused in these portraits and yes, playfulness as well. He shared a mock-up for a small publication with me that would feature his longtime partner and muse. I'm saddened that it never came to fruition to be out in the world, but I'm thrilled that James, that you have it. And I hope that sometime I can see it again. That would be a real treat. I'm gonna close with reading from the introduction to the catalog that accompanied the Palmer Gallery retrospective. Composing in a viewfinder, Lindblom's careful observation controls what the viewer does not need to see, leaving us with squares of beauty that focus on salt marsh grass, the ocean, woods, store windows, and Florence, Italy. Eric Lindblom told me that he is not afraid of the beautiful. And for this, we as viewers are grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Monica.
I think Michelle and, and Bill, you're up next. Sorry, we had a little kerf a little zoom kerf zoom kerfuffle. The new <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm just gonna uh, share screen also. Okay. Um, and show the the three books that we did with them as collaborators. And Bill's gonna fill in some anecdotes. So. So um, the river that runs two ways. So um, it, the hardest part, we were thrilled about the photos. We loved the poems, of course, because I had done two collaborations of my own with Nancy in the past. And Eric was really keen to, to get something tactile like this and to, and to collaborate with Nancy. And so, um, but he wasn't keen on making 15 of each photograph. <laughs> so he kept saying, even way back then, in the year 2000, 21 years ago, he kept saying, I'm not getting any younger, you know? I have other things I wanna do. So he very dramatically made a, a graph showing how much he had progressed in, in making the additions. And uh, he would send us an update of the graph by snail mail. Um, <clears throat> but we did it. And um, there was a lot of very exciting back and forth. And if you don't know our work very well, um, the type was all set by hand in lead movable type, uh, actually in Romulus typeface and printed letterpress. And the paper was called Willow Creek made by Twin Rocker Paper um, who are out of Indiana. And they really are national treasures. They are, Catherine and, uh, what's, I, can't, I blanked on his name. Yeah, How, Howard. Howard Clark um, are really responsible for starting and enlivening the handmade paper movement in the United States. <laughs> And um, they made this paper in huge sheets. I think they were 40 by 60 um, for us custom. Uh, actually that last photo, there's Nancy way back in the distance. And this is at Mary Frank's house, the sculptor and the painter. Um, and so here are a few pages. Oh, I guess that's it. Um, a quick anecdote about that is that Eric told us all the photographs would be the same size and we had to make wells for each photo. And it turns out that was completely not true. Each photo had a fractional difference in their actual scale. So the wells were awkward in some cases and too tight in others. So it became, I found them this morning, all the templates for each one of the photographs uh, to make the wells for, for them. So it was just one of those things that <laughs> he said, well, it's a handmade book. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> it, we, we agreed it was, but um, fitting them in the well was uh, also one of our jobs. Um, so we had to well kind of fitting. wrestle him into submission. And uh, but he, it was a wonderful time. And he drove the binder crazy, um, wondering when the thing was going to be done. And um, and it got done and it was very beautiful. So um, the next book we did with them is called Diana in Sight. And that is um, the private lives in public places photos. Um, but we called it after we changed the name of it and we called it Diana in Sight after the Diana camera. And for this one, this is twin rocker paper also, but in a blue color. And um, we made these pages where we cut out a window and put the photograph underneath. So to set it off like that. And these are some of the, the greatest poems. Um, they're both, the drowned man is an incredibly serious 
and dark poem. Nancy Willard was not all lightness. <laughs> she had the dark going and um, the swing. So those are some examples from that book. And then and we liked collaborating so much that we decided the four of us should do a book together. So um, I did etchings in, re in um, response to Eric's photographs of water or waves and Bill did woodcuts. This is one on the title page and, and as end sheets. Nancy wrote the poems and we, and they're housed in these uh, kind of triptych portfolios in that box that you saw at first. So, um, and these are the etchings. And I, I did the etchings on very thin paper, which got kind of a watery, um, warpy feel when you used it with an etching. And so the four, we had a wonderful time and he sent us all sorts of photographs to uh, work from, and I had to choose uh, which ones. So that's the Brighton Press involvement. Uh, Bill has a few letters or well, comments. Just, just for the sake of time here, and um, I'm responding to James slightly on this too, because I'm saying kind of the same thing as James, but I wanted to do it um, quickly here because of uh, the time factor. And I, so I wrote notes out. Um, I have a tendency when I speak to wander and stray from any given format and time constraint. So I will read the following notes rather than allow the emotional possibilities to have their way with me because our, our files are so filled from both Eric and Nancy with uh, everything you could possibly imagine in terms of things coming through the mail and you'd open them up and it would be, it's an experience. And as I said, I've spent a couple of days now kind of going through it all. And I still, you know, I found myself reading almost everything. So I made three quick notes on uh, what I was feeling when I was doing this. Um, there was always a remarkable and deeply felt respect between Nancy and Eric. The poet, as she is listening to the, fog, the, the photographer describe things or telling stories without the implied too much, said of him, the loquacious Lindblom. The photographer speaking to the poet, as we were pulling a jumping choya cactus out of her hand, oh Nancy, the desert has never seen the likes of you. This was the kind of trips that we got to go on with them. And uh, it was amusing to say the absolute le le uh, the least about that. But um, I think Monica described or somebody described that, uh, that uh, Nancy would bend down and pick up almost anything. And uh, uh, I shared with her the uh, owl purses out in the desert. And we spent an afternoon opening up owl purses and looking at little tiny bones. And I wrote about that. They were both wanderers and this held true to the way their art forms took shape. They would drive off together on truly spectacular journeys like restlessness turning into words and images, then return to the dark room or the desk to carry on with their thoughts, which by the way, were numerous. So it's the way, um, the way they were described as going, uh, stopping the trips at dark, but they would go out in the afternoon on these wondrous journeys together. And we got to go on some of those with them. Um, yes, and the last point. Um, this may seem obvious, but for books like this one, the existence of a collaboration, a, to a, a togetherness, is the very nature and fabric of the whys and hows an idea like this one gets made. And that's the important thing. Um, in our books, we work a lot with poets, we work a lot with artists, we work with each other in this way. And we're looking for that, that special relationship that exists between two people, two artists in their own right. And in this case, um, I have so much pulled, but I'm going to reserve it for later. But um, 
there is such evidence in our in our correspondence with them of things that they found in their own special way in each case things that were really really special to them and uh that's partially why uh our relationship to them is sorely missed at this point and uh we would travel across the country and stay with them often and uh th those stories are too numerous to recount as well so i think i'm going to end it with that wait read yeah. eric's letter which one either one okay his voice well there are so many hundreds of these um as you can see for the enclosed when i went back to the salt meadows in august i think i think and his writing's a little hard to read. I took an egg beater along with the camera. Find also a booklet of that Vassar that Vassar produced for a lovely exhibit of Nancy's children's books in their library. They were always talking about each other in that way. Um, the, the poet and the photographer finding their own ways to describe each other. And that was a great part of it. Um, I didn't restrict the choices here to photographs that I think of as candidates for the waves. Didn't, didn't know if you were experimenting with your Hockney tricks. He had sent me a whole pile of um, photographs and wanted, wanted me to cut them apart and experiment with them and see what I could kind of do with that. So there was always that provocation too. And Eric was quite good at that, at provoking us into things. And uh, so we got even when we made him make 15 photographs for this. Uh, for this book. <laughs> and, he was uh, very, very good from that on. <laughs> yeah, he did stop complaining. <laughs> so I think that's Thank last of my contribution. Thank you both. That was that was wonderful to hear all those memories. Yeah. Andy, I think you're next, and you have a segue from the river that runs two ways. The closing poem in the river that runs two ways is called An Open Book. If the tree speaks true, the hills are holy, not for the tree's sake, but for the road unwinding this tale. If the road speaks true, not for the story's sake, but for the book you hold in your hand, the pages turning to hills, the road telling all, the trees speaking, the glad words running to meet you. Dear friends, Sasha. Thank you, guys. That was beautiful. Um, all right. Um, let me just. Yeah, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Yeah, great. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sasha Bush. Um, a quick few thank yous before I jump in um, to my presentation. Um, James, thank you for letting me care for your father's archives. Um, Nicole, thank you for this wonderful website. Um, I really do encourage everybody to go check it out. Um, uh, and to echo what Ron was saying, Nicole did all this under a lot of pressure and in a short amount of time. Um, thank you everybody for coming out and joining us. Um, and Ron, thank you for inviting me to, to curate this exhibition. Um, Samantha, thank you for everything and for all of your love. Um, Thank you to all my fellow panelists. It's really wonderful uh, to be in conversation with you and to hear so many different sides of, um, of Eric's work. Um, James uh, and I were talking about this, um, this exhibition and you know, we we're talking about all the different ways that um, Eric's work had been introduced and supported over the years. I wanna say that this work of uh, my exhibition really builds um, on all the work, uh, much of it supported by the panelists here and different institutions um, in introducing um, Eric's work and supporting Eric's work. Um, and I certainly could not have done this kind of a deep dive uh, into 
one particular facet of Eric's work without the support for many, many years. I'm an introduction you know, through publications, through retrospectives um, of Eric's work. Um, a quick introduction, I grew up down the street from Eric and Nancy, um, and as a young person, uh, kind of long before I really could think of myself as a photographer, um, uh, I started working with Eric in his darkroom as his assistant. And Eric grew to become a dear friend and a dear mentor, somebody who I would show work to, whose work I would get to look at. We would talk about photography, what he was working on, what I was working on. Um, so this exhibition, Work Prints, uh, as Ron said, is about the, the panoramic photographs that Eric made in, around the Hudson Valley. Uh, and before I get into it, um, I want to quickly define the difference between work prints and limited edition prints. Um, so just as a starter, photography is an easily reproducible medium. And so photographers constantly have to deal with this question, how do you make your work unique? Uh, how do you make your work singular and individual, both from an artistic perspective and from uh, a monetary perspective, right? Um, and so we that Eric did this, Eric was an old school photographer, so he grew up and uh, learned photography in the age when photographers would make large limited editions. Um, and Eric dealt with, you know, with the reproducibility of the medium by making limited editions. And limited editions are just that, they're a, a set number of prints made at a certain size. Um, from a creative practices side, uh, thinking about Eric's practice, limited edition prints state answers. Um, they represent the fully resolved, fully completed idea or project. And limited edition prints are made for the public. So, you know, when you're seeing uh, a lot of Eric's work in exhibitions, um, when you see them in, you know, The River That Runs Two Ways, in Monica's retrospective, um, in other exhibitions, you're most likely seeing a limited edition print. Um, work prints, on the other hand, uh, are numerous. They are copies. Um, many of them were made uh, as a way to get to those limited edition prints. And from another creative practices side, limited edition prints are the unresolved, incomplete idea. Um, they represent the trials, the experiments, the ways that Eric would figure out. Um, I think it was uh, James or Monica who said, you know, which ones were the keepers and which ones um, were not, right? Um, so this exhibition began with a set of questions. Um, one set of questions being, why did Eric make so many work prints? And what did those work prints mean to Eric? And another one, what can we learn about Eric's growth and development as a photographer if we look at his work prints? I didn't really understand why Eric had so many work prints when I first started working in his darkroom. And last June, when I started working with James and uh, co-caretaking Eric's archive, I also didn't quite understand it or appreciate it at that time. And, you know, in looking over Eric's work over the last six months, um, and in thinking about this exhibition specifically, something jumped out to me that had been present um, in all of the publications and all of the work, but hadn't been so explicit, explicitly centered. And that's the element of repetition. Um, you know, you heard Monica talking about it and Michelle and Bill talking about, you know, Eric reworking prints and returning to the same places and over, over and over again. But you know, thinking about the element of repetition um, uh, in sort of such a central way made me wonder, you know, why did Eric return to the same places over and over again? Um, and why did he return to the same prints? You know, as James said, um, he and Nancy went to Cape Cod for 50 years. Uh, and he photographed, you know, for a good portion of those 50 years, he photographed in the salt marsh grasses. He photographed in the pine woods. Um, so this, you know, sort of questioning of why, um, uh, what about repetition brought on another set of questions for this exhibition, which is, um, you know, along with why did Eric return to the same prints, the same places, um, uh, what did he think about repetition specifically? And if we think about repetition um, as a central element of his practice, what can we learn about his work? Um, so thinking about repetition in that kind of way brought me to four different kinds of elements that I, uh, along which I curated this exhibition. I mean, those elements being light, soil, air, and water. Um, but before I get into that, I mean, I'm gonna walk us through um, some of these plates and think about the way I'm, I'm 
uh, interpreting Eric's work. I just want to quickly talk about um, looking and searching and trawling, um, as Eric would say, when we've got for um, photographing trawling for pictures um, and the kinds of attention that uh, are represented in his work. Um, I would guess that you know when Eric went out the first time around the Hudson Valley with a panoramic camera, you know, a new, very expansive way of looking at a familiar landscape everything looked exciting and everything looked amazing. Um, and when he went back to make contact sheets and make prints of his, um, uh, of his explorations, everything looked exciting. And that kind of attention um, is much, uh, is sort of about exploration. Um, you're discovering what your eye is seeing and what you're reacting to. Um, but I would guess that, you know, after going back to the same uh, places, Peach Hill and Poughkeepsie, Kingston, Saugerties, um, and returning to the darkroom over and over again, you know, that um, kind of attention shifted because Eric was not interested, although he was interested in repetition, he wasn't interested in making the exact same pictures. And so when he would go back to Peach Hill, you know, he would go back with, you know, um, some pictures in his mind that he'd made of trees that had worked well, that whereas I think it was Monica who said that were keepers. Right? Some that were actually like really good keepers that were held his attention um, and some that were weaker. And he would go back not wanting to make the exact same picture of a tree, um, but to make something that would be in relationship to some of the other images that he made. And so that kind of return uh, and focus on repetition uh, works as a shift and a shift in attention. And that kind of attention of returning with a uh, desire to make different kinds of images, but images that add to what is there uh, um, can serve to be uh, sort of an attention that relates more to accumulation. How can you add to something but make it be different? Um, so I wanna start with the first element um, in this uh, exhibition, which is light. Um, you know, just going back to what James said, um, you know, Eric, uh, lived in his house with Nancy Willard um, for, you know, 50 years, but I think at heart he was a Midwesterner, right? And he was a, um, which is to say he was pretty reserved and he would not have talked about um, magic um, and being enraptured with nature in the same way that Nancy did, um, uh, so openly and so um, in her books uh, and poetry. But if we look at these first three images um, shot in um, Poughkeepsie, There's a slight variation, right? And there's, um, but what are these if they're not a celebration of light? And if you look at these images and you look at these compositions, there's a slight subtle difference between the um, grass that is mowed and the grass that is uncut. And you see all those delicate tones. You see in this first one, that sort of mass of shadow that lets your eye sit in that shadow and echoes with the shadows that are farther down this path. Um, this is a very, you know, emotional, loving um, uh, celebration of light. Um, what we see in these three images too is, you know, something that um, I am also curious about, which is Eric's body in relation to his photographs. Um, Eric very much constructed photographs, um, not passively made them, but actually constructed them. Uh, and so in these three first images, we can see him as he's moving around, um, his subject. We can see him rotating left, right, a, slow, uh, a, sm a small variation, right? But each of those variations results in a very different kind of image. Um, and so that relates to and speaks to in a certain way, Eric's body and the way that he's actually moving in this space. Um, if we turn to the next plates, um, four, five, and six, we can think about the next element, which is soil. And I want to start with this one. Now, out of these three, this is the least resolved. Um, these are three different variations of the same photograph. Uh, when I was looking at Eric's archive in preparation for the show, there are dozens of examples of this, of Eric carefully reworking um, a print. And, you know, Eric was a master black and white printer. So, you know, his limited edition prints are flawless. And his work prints are nearly as flawless. But out of the three of these here, this one is the least resolved. So there's no separation really in tones between blacks and whites and grays, which means that 
your eye, as you're moving through this image, doesn't know what to focus on. We can see that in this upper right corner here, Eric has burned uh, this tree. Burning is a, a process by which in the dark room, you selectively change um, the exposure in one part of the print. Um, and so you can see that this has been burned. So it leaves my eye up to you know, this tree, but it's not really, once I get there, my interest is sort of off. It's not enough to hold my interest. And so this um, composition feels the least directed, feels like my eye is sort of going all over the place. If we turn back to this composition here, this is uh, clearly much darker. And here, Eric has emphasized the shadows. And if you look at these, um, these shadows, you have these strong black lines of these trees that are echoed by these sort of subtler, softer shadows of the grasses here. And here, my eye is very much not moving, but is settling into those shadows. And your eye is invited to settle into the shadows and settle into the meditative um, nature of being in this space. This uh, photograph, this version has a very different energy because of those shadows and because of the way that Eric has um, decided to tone it. And so my eye can jump back and forth between these two tree trunks. We see that this patch of trees has been darkened, but it fits tonally in with this patch of, um, here. Um, and so this is a you know, much darker image. Um, if we turn to the last um, version here, now we have a very different image. And this is also all as a result of the light of Eric toning the image in the darkroom, playing with the exposure. But now we have a very balanced image. So we have a balance between the lightest tones and the darkest tones. My eye is invited and your eye is invited um, to drift across this soft diagonal to the back of the composition. My eye can drift laterally across here from the tree trunks, but they're in balance. They're not calling attention to themselves. And this feels, um, this and that second one feel much more resolved and much more directed where Eric is really sculpting your eye towards uh, different parts of the image. Um, if we turn to the next element, which is air. Um, and I wanna look at plates, you know, eight to 11 or so. So in plate eight and in plate nine, we have these sort of very interesting um, vertical energies, vertical and horizontal energies. We have, you know, Eric looking through this thicket of dry grass. We have this sort of outsized, oversized tree trunk. We're not really sure exactly what we're looking at, but we have this very um, dynamic um, vertical energy that begins at the bottom of the composition and goes to the top, which drives our eye up to these tree trunks here, and which leads us to what is that? Is that a mountain? Is that a hill? The scale is thrown off, and we're aware that the perspective is a little bit lower, which means that we're also sort of aware that Eric, you know, big man that Eric was, six feet plus, you know, is squatting down, right? Or the tripod is set at a lower angle. And so you're looking through the air, you're looking through those stalks, um, and you're aware of that lower perspective. If we go to nine, instead of um, a vertical energy, there's a sort of horizontal energy. If you are, you know, maybe a native English speaker, you're reading uh, left to right. If you're a native Arabic speaker, maybe you're reading um, light right to left, but you're going across these willow stalks. And again, you're also peering through this thicket and you're not really sure what you're looking at. And so the sense of scale is really thrown off um, in this image. Sasha. Yeah. Could I quickly interrupt? Um, I think you need to click um, on the slideshow because a couple people have been saying the images seem small. Would sure. it be bigger if you? Yeah, is this, is this better? Yeah, I think that's a little better. Yep. Perfect, Thank okay, you. sorry about that. So um, we have this different energy, but we're looking through this thicket here. Um, we emerge onto these two uh, compositions um, that really emphasize air, right? And they're weighted um, in such a way on the right and on the left by those strong dark lines, those trunks, and those trunks anchor that, those compositions. Here we're anchored on the left and here we're anchored on the right. And we should be able to see more. We've just been in the thickets, right? So we should be able to see more, but we actually can't really see all that more because we have all that mist there. But those two anchoring of black lines and black trunks give us the space both visually 
and really metaphorically room to breathe and air to breathe. And it gives us all that space to wander around these compositions and to sit with Eric. Um, and here too, we're aware, you know, these are very similar images, right? And, um, but we're aware that here he is again, turning to the left, turning to the right, small variation, but a very different kind of print. You know, if we turn um, to the last element, uh, which is water, in the last few plates, we have Eric moving forward and back, closer and, and um, nearer and farther away. You know, Eric is not as close as he will be in Monica's exhibition when he's actually standing with his tripod in the waves, right? In that point, he's right on top of water. Um, but here we have him in this sort of interesting approach, uh, again, speaking to his body and how he's moving forward and back. You know, sometimes he's closer. So here we have a very, very tactile image. We can imagine him crunching on those ice flows. We can see the really hard um, light, right? Um, glanting off of those ice flows. Um, and here it's softer. Um, and here we can't really see the water, um, but we know, I think that this is um, maybe, um, in a swamp. And here we're again a little bit farther away, but we can hear that sound of the water ebbing and flowing. And then here we're looking through a thicket again. And so even though we can't see the water all over the composition, we can hear it and we can see. It. And so he's moving, you know, closer and farther away, thinking about water and thinking about, you know, um, water in different ways. Um, so I want to end by saying, you know, um, now having spent time with Eric and having spent time with Eric's work prints, I can fully understand the need for that. And I can understand that even as Eric reached, you know, the highs of those exhibitions, those limited edition prints, those books, he was uh, constantly developing and constantly working. And as a, a good artist, he would constantly rework his material because he saw that in his work prints, in returning to um, the same places, and really in thinking about repetition, as a formal subject, as a way of um, a formal element of his work, it allowed him to continue to grow as a photographer. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. And thank you, everyone. Um, that was just really wonderful. I wish we had more time. Um, but we do have a little more time and uh, we, we save some time at the end for questions. And I see a, a, a few have come in. Um, I think Laura, are you gonna help us uh, with, with those am. questions? I Thank am. You. The first one is from Janine St. Germain. She asks, what was Eric's relationship to the locales he shot most often? Was he personally associated with Frederick Frank, Mary Frank, Opus 40? Roy Canwit, et cetera, or did he discover this subject matter while traveling through the Hudson Valley with Nancy? I'm not sure who the best person is to answer this. Perhaps, perhaps James? Muted here. I can answer a little bit. I know that uh, Mary Frank and Frederick Frank at least were uh, actual you know, friends of, of his and, 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 my, and my mother's as well. So, uh, you know, all the photos that he took at Frederick Frank's um, uh, property, you know, it grew out of his friendship with him. Now, as far as did he meet, say, Frederick Frank through the art first, or did he meet him in another capacity and then grow to appreciate what was on his property and want to take photos? That I'm not sure. But uh, I know for some of the places that you're mentioning, there was a real personal relationship that he had with it. And it wasn't simply just dropping in on yeah. Frederick Frank on a couple of occasions to take some photos and then retreat. Thank you. Uh, the next one is from, St I'm sorry if I butcher your name here, Sam Marga uh, Vicious. This Sorry. Did Eric describe photographs in similar similar ways to the ways you're describing them, Sasha? I wonder if there's any story that stands out as him describing to you how to rest your eyes and soak into the picture. Thanks, Sam. Uh, that's a good question. Um, 
I don't know. I don't know if Eric really would. Um, I don't know if he would really think. He definitely thought of that way um, and thought of himself, you know, as um, an introspective photographer. Certainly, you know, as you can tell from from Monica's retrospective, right? Pretty early on, Eric figured out his kind of sensibility, which was much more quiet and restrained. I don't think that he would have really spoken about it. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't think he would have really spoken about it as so directly as saying, you know, um, these are pictures that um, let you be meditative. I think, you know, in the exact opposite, his most, um, his last project that he did was his Diana and Psych um, project, or which was the Windows uh, photographs, the Diana F Windows photographs. And those are much less about meditative and much more about a very different kind of um, energy back and forth, sort of like looking through and back as Monica said. Um, but I think that it was sort of um, through getting to know Eric as a very quiet, um, humble person that came through with his photographs. If, if I may, I'll add, uh, following something, Bill, that you had said, the loquacious limb bloom in, in many, many conversations that I, I had with him never spoke about his photographs. He only wanted to speak about Nancy. We, we spoke about Nancy's poetry many, many times. Uh, the one that I read was the last poem of Nancy's that I read to him. Uh, he spoke about Nancy's poetry with uh, a great love of Nancy, also great love of poetry. But no matter how hard I tried to get him to speak about his photography, um, the conversation would quickly revert back to, to discussing poetry and particularly Nancy's. This is really true. and. Uh... We had an experience with him making a hand gravure photograph of his um, of one image, and hand gravure is a plate wiped an etching plate wiped um, image done through photography, and it's a very rich black. But it was a very annoying process in the sense that uh, to get the whites up to his specification was um, was kind of a nightmare, and uh, so yes, when when we talked about life itself. Uh, he didn't really talk about the, the photographs much, but when you were making them with him, the, co the conversation was often about um, all the stuff that Sasha was speaking about, all the different possibilities that light would have on a photograph. And, uh, you know, even to the point where the background colors of the paper in the books were really almost instrumental as to how he would print the photograph. So that darker green, that was another aspect that we had to really concentrate on um, seeing how the, um, the tones of his print matched the overall tones of the book itself. And, and yes, then the words were um, incredibly important to his way of seeing his images. And it was quite beautiful to watch that side of it. Um, I what he would do is lay his photographs out for us and then step back, you know, and then we would stare at them and make comments. I was just going to add that I think he was someone who really wanted to make sure that he had a good photograph so that um, he looked so carefully at everything in that when, when I was looking at his stuff, unless it had passed this first round, to be in this pool to be selected from, it wasn't going to be considered. It was a lot about specificity. And um, he had real integrity about what he put out in the world because I think he had an understanding of how much stuff is out in the world. And he wanted what he put out there to be, you know, his very best. So I really respected that because it really wasn't about, um, you know, him needing any sort of attention. It was all about the work and the work being the best work that he could put out there. So. I just want to jump in just quickly off of that because I think echoing what Monica was saying and I got to work with Eric in the darkroom and some of those photographs I showed, you know, um, Eric was so 
careful and about, you know, every single corner was considered and every single edge was considered. And, and that was part of his process of reworking material to get to know it better. And so, you know, if you were to ask Eric, I think head on, you know, are your pictures meditative? Can you sink into them? You know, what's an example? Um, he wouldn't, um, you know, he wouldn't have an answer for that. But if you look at, uh, with him at, you know, at a print, he could tell you, you know, oh, this print doesn't quite work because yeah, my eye goes off of this corner and this corner doesn't work. Or yeah, this print feels much stronger because look at the way that your eyes sort of um, stays in the frame. So, you know, he was um, a photographer, you know, also, um, you know, uh, um, you know, he, he would construct really, he would really construct the frame in a very um, deliberate and, and specific kind of way. And I think the next question comes from uh, Judy Dallenmeyer. And she writes that she, uh, they encountered Nancy and Eric on the Vassar farm as bird watchers. Was he very involved in bird watching? Uh, to my knowledge, neither one of them were dedicated ornithologists uh, for, for its own sake. You know, my mom may have had some, some books on bird watching that she had used for research or because she liked some of the more exotic bird names, but I am fairly certain that neither of them ever pursued bird watching as a passion of going out with a pair of binoculars and you know, waiting all day for hoping to see something. Yeah. We have a little more time for some more questions. Um, what we have right now are a few comments. Uh, one that I'll read just for your information comes from Alice Quinn. I think Nancy and Eric may have known Mary Frank through Jane Mayhall and Leslie Katz of the Eakins Press, is it Eakins or Aikens, not sure, who published Nancy's poetry. Oh, I'm sorry, Deborah Dashmore um, asks, did he crop the photos? I, I can jump in for that. Um, he was an old school photographer, so he cropped with his feet for the most part. Um, he would not crop, you know, and he, he was very much of the ethos um, that you don't crop your images. But, you know, one of the images I included in those first three plates is a crop. Um, of an image in which I found very surprising and striking. And so, uh, which points to the fact that, you know, um, maybe not publicly, because again, you know, the work prints are for, for himself and his own growth as a photographer. Um, so maybe publicly he wouldn't, you know, put out cropped images, um, you know, but privately he was open, you know, for himself, for his own development, he's open to all, all kinds of things. Uh, we have another question from Danny Peralta. How much of his practice was as an educator? Oh, I, I think I can say a little bit about that, which is that, um, you know, we have an, a lot of classes in the Vassar Special Collections where uh, classes will come in, students will come in and we'll look at materials. And on a number of occasions, usually at least once and sometimes a couple of times a year, um, Nancy and Eric would, would come in to the classroom um, to look at uh, some Brighton Press books or um, other uh, works that they had produced um, to talk to them, uh, to talk to the students. Um, I think they both, you know, obviously Nancy was a teacher. I think they both loved those um, experiences. They loved being with the students. Um, and maybe that was the time you guys, and now that I'm thinking of it, when he did talk a little bit about his photos, he didn't say too much. I'm trying to remember, but I do have some recollections of him saying, you know, like a student would ask about a photograph and, and he might say a little bit. I feel like there was a little bit there. Uh, definitely still Midwestern, um, but maybe, maybe that was a different setting for him as an educator. 
um, trying to say a little bit. I remember in particular, I don't know, you know, it's weird how you remember certain things, but I remember one time he was talking about a photograph he took in Kingston, New York, Kingston, a town north of us. And we actually now have this photograph in our collection. It was a picture of, uh, he had gone to a, a lake in Kingston, took a picture with some people in the photo, but it was a beach and there was a sailboat that had come up on the shore. And um, the student, you know, wondered why he took that picture. And he, he, he talked about how this sailboat had just sailed up there and that caught him. And uh, that, that was the moment of inspiration. So I wonder if we could make an exception for, for education uh, when maybe he would say a little bit more about his photos. Maybe I'll add something also because I'm in the unusual position of knowing both the teacher and the student. Uh, <laughs> Sasha, when you would come home from Eric's dark room, you talked like you'd been to see the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> but when I would have breakfast with Eric, he would talk about your photos as a colleague. And uh, since I'm a teacher too, I learned so much from, from hearing Eric speak as a, as a teacher. And I'm sure that that's why he was um, uh, so good. And I know not only with you, but from some other young people in the neighborhood who Eric welcomed and nurtured uh, and treated like uh, colleagues. Uh, we're all out trying to make our best images and we're all learning from the process. I think that's it for our questions. So Ron, if you want to wrap things up. Okay, thanks very much, Laura. Um, how do I wrap things up? You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you all with this. Um, I can't see all of you in attendance. I see there were nearly 100 of you. Um, and I can't see you all but I can see my my colleagues here, the panelists. And um, there was one moment during our evening tonight when, um, Bill, you were talking about, you know, Nancy and Eric visiting you. And uh, I think talking with them uh, when you were on a walk, maybe it was when Nancy uh, bent down to, to pick something up. And when you said that, I looked at all every, everyone here that I can see and everyone was smiling. And I bet you that everyone in the audience was smiling um, at the same time. When we, when we, we all have these um, memories of them, not only their work, but also as people. And I think when we do, uh, you know, have times like this when we can talk about it, it just bring smiles to our faces. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks to the panelists, especially um, thanks to everyone who came. Um, I hope there'll be some, some follow-ups. If you'd like to get a copy of the publication, let us know. You can reach out to us, of course. And um, I hope these discussions will continue going forward. Can I just quickly say it brings smiles to our faces out here to hear what you all had to say. So I thank you all for such a wonderful, heartfelt afternoon, especially after Zooming all day. <laughs> <laughs> so it was lovely. Thank you.